Hello friends and gamers and welcome to the Lion's Den. It is the home of Sky Marshall. So it might actually be called the Aerodrome at this point. <laughs> but it, anyways, it is the, the location for this tournament for Gold War 1936, Clash of Titans. It's a fantastic board game. We really enjoy ourselves here so far. You miss out on a lot of what you don't see here because it's just hard to encompass the, the scope and the atmosphere behind all this. The fantastic table, the board itself. There's a second board over there which is beautiful in its own right. We have trophies and awards and medals here. We have a, a massive cup over there on a pedestal that rotates. We have all this over here. We have clocks up here as well. Ticking away is just the atmosphere, the ambiance, the camaraderie, the enjoyment, the jokes that go with it with people who love the same thing as we do. It's a truly fantastic experience. So I want to go over what the first day looked like here. We're starting on our day two. Yesterday we spent from about 6 p.m. to 11 p.m., well, 10 p.m., so about four hours there, playing our game on this table, and we did three full turns. Now, the other table, in contrast, perhaps a bit more experienced players, they ran through five turns in the same amount of time. So we like to think it's because we're more calculating, careful, cautious, you know, uh, uh, reveling in, in, in the actual movement of things, but most likely it's just because we're slow. <laughs> but anyways, so I wanted to do a little bit of an intro on the side of things, and then I'm going to go on the map and give a little bit more in-depth. Now, other people are covering it on a turn-by-turn -turn basis, so check out General Hand Grenade's um, videos for his table, and Sky Marshall on this table as well for the turn-by-turn -turn play of what's going on. I'm going to give a little bit more strategic depth to what I explain, and some of it's going to give away strategy to uh, my opponents if they happen to listen to this video, but I'm doing it early morning on the second day, so perhaps they might not get to it by the time I run through my paces here on this game. So I'll cover some ground here, and I uh, will go off of that and see how it goes. So thank you all for being watching. If you have any questions, please comment. I might not get to it, but somebody else might comment and be response and kind of cover some ground. But I want to say that thank you to the hosts to this thing. It's a truly memorable experience and one of the highlights of my year, to be honest. And I really enjoy it. It's a fantastic board game design. I enjoy the playing it, <laughs> even though it is an immense monster board game. I enjoy playing it. I enjoy this room. I enjoy the board. I enjoy the companionship. It's just, uh, it's fantastic. So without further ado, let's get into more strategy. First off, we start with Germany. Germany has been playing an interesting game this time, and I haven't seen this kind of thing before. Germany has actually saved every single dollar it's made since the start of the game. So currently they sit at 61 IPP, which is a huge amount of money. With that, they can purchase, I don't know what it would be, six tanks and six mechanized units so far. And if they hold true to their course, you know, by the time July 1938 rolls around, they'll be able to purchase eight of each at the outbreak. So that will be really interesting and it presents a strategic problem for France. And one of those problems that I might not be able to resolve because at the end of the day, with those purchases at Germany, if it does make those purchases, France won't be able to hold out in any meaningful way. It'll be expensive for Germany to grab every French territory because they're going to be taking casualties on their tanks as opposed to on cheaper equipment like cavalry, infantry and the like. But in the end, they'll still be able to crush France, although a little bit more expensively, they'll be able to crush it quicker. So that's one thing worth noting. Germany has also not built any submarines which is interesting to note as well. And perhaps this is giving away too much, but it's one of those things that if Germany wants to put some pressure on the convoy system that the British have, it needs to start building submarines and shipping them out to faraway parts. As it stands, the German submarines still sit over here off the coast of uh, well, the Kiel Canal there off of, uh, not Hamburg would it be, Wilhelmshaven, let's say. <laughs> so that's kind of where they are right now. And it's a bit of a mystery as to what their intentions are. From our perspective, it could be a host of different things. It might even be a naval transport fleet to do an amphibious invasion of Britain. Now, in my opinion, I don't think that's the best course of action because if London falls, then America's income goes up by 25 bucks. So you exchange one enemy for another one because that 25 bucks income increase, it pretty well brings America a large way into the war at that point, especially with its dice rolls. It's practically at the doorstep already. So it moves things along quite rapidly. And you might lose on, on a turn's worth of treasury from Britain, but you can still persist and still have your units on the map, re-establish a new capital, and in exchange you get you know an extra 25 bucks for the Americans, so it kind of compensates for the loss of the British treasury. So 
as a perspective, I believe the British full treasury is about 23 bucks at wartime income. So you lose 23 bucks to the British, but you gain 25 bucks to the Americans. So it's a trade-off and I'm not sure it's the most advisable trade-off because that still leaves Germany with the problem of France to deal with. So it's hard to do everything if they want to. Well, next up, let's take a look at the Spanish Civil War. In the Spanish Civil War, we've had some interesting change of affairs here because for it's been ebbing and turning. <laughs> now the Nationalists hold on to Madrid with two infantry and two artillery, but the Republicans aren't out of the game yet. They don't. They own a few territories, even though they're not very well occupied at this point. But they have three infantry, one cavalry. Sorry, an Austria Navarre, and over here we have one militia. So it's not. A horrible situation for them to be in, especially with their anti-aircraft gun here as well. It means that if the nationalists decide to attack them here with these two fighters and these two, inf oh, uh, sorry, and these four units here, they're going to go in for a difficult time, and we'll have to see how that goes. Now we struck a deal between the French and the, or the Allies rather, and the Russians to say, if you lend lease us an anti-aircraft gun to France, we will support we will bump up and upgrade any militia that you have in place in Republican Spain because we looked at the math behind it and said, well, it's either two victory points to the to the to the Axis powers or it's one well two victory points to the to the um common turn, but the likely scenario in this situation is the the Axis would be able to hold on to those victory points until the end of the game, whereas the communist ones if this all turned Republican, then once Germany declares war on Russia, then it all becomes Russian as well, which means that if the Germans control France, then they might be influenced into pushing into Spain as well, thereby negating those victory points that the Russians get. So that's kind of our, our idea of why we're supporting the Republicans, if at all possible. So that's the situation in Spain, and it's been a fantastic play by Kaiser uh, Serenora, I believe is the correct way, or one of the ways to pronounce it. I don't know if it's the correct way, but that's what's going on there. So he's done some fantastic work. I think he is a good mixture of boldness and, uh, well, he's, he's a fantastic character. He's a good mixture of, of taking things that need to be done, taking them by the horns and, and, just, and, and just doing whatever needed, needs to be done. So he's got a good mixture of calculation and boldness, which sometimes I like that boldness. I will refer to one mistake I made later on, but... But uh, so far, it's been going quite well for the Republicans, and, and we're pleased to see how that's going as well. The fleet, the Republican Navy, is present over here, and they're slowly chasing after the Nationalists. And it's one of those weird situations like, what do you do exactly in those situations? And honestly, uh, I think, yeah, it's tough to say. You know, <laughs> it's tough to say exactly what a person should do, because they can scooch over to... Um, to uh, they can scooch over into the Baltic, and then perhaps the Republicans can grab them up over there. Theoretically, I'm not sure if they can actually enter the Baltic yet, because the Danish Straits might be locked down to neutral Spain. I'm not too sure about that, actually. Anyways, that covers that. So I'm going to go in order of play. Next up, we have the Russians. Now, I've already talked a little bit about Russian uh, Republican Spain, with a fantastic job played by Kaiser Serenora. I should also state that, that Germany is being played by a global war enthusiast, who I find a very pleasant individual. And, you know, with this air of mystery behind the Germans, I think it's an interesting play. And uh, it's it, it, it's unique, right, at the very least. And I, I enjoy it, you know, that suspense. It has me terrified as France as to what its intentions are. And likewise, I'm sure my British counterpart will feel the same way in regards to Britain itself. Uh, you know, what are they going to do? <laughs> Which direction are they going to go? Because at this rate, they can go in any direction they want to and they haven't locked themselves in. In regards to Russia, nothing too much has occurred because it is still kind of early game. We've seen some, uh, you know, collectivization of a lot of units into the capital cities, which is a fair move. And it keeps you a little bit further away from the action and gives you a bit more reaction time. There might be a little bit more collectivization of troops up here in... Um, in Leningrad with the intention of pushing into Finnish territory, which is a good move. We are playing with something, I've referred to this before, but the prestige and campaign medals. So one of the easier bronze stars that can be achieved by the Russian player is just concluding a combat uh, to the point where you can't legally proceed any further with the combat. Uh, essentially, a winter war. You win A winter war, you capture the territory. If you sign the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, you basically grab Vipuri and the war is done. Or if you don't want to sign the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, then you have to grab all of the Finnish territory. Or instead of doing Finland territory, you could do Mongolia, you could do you know Iran, or whatever you want to in that regards, just to get that first bronze star. So 
it's going to be pretty achievable for one bronze star. Two bronze stars is something that you will have to strive a little bit. And then three is quite an experienced play. And then four is, you know, you really, it's going to be once in a blue moon kind of thing. Uh, you know, a rare event, I would say. You really have to quite dominate. So that's what's happening on the Russian front. We see a few more Russian units put here in Transcaucasus, which is probably a great thing because Transcaucasus, it does, if I remember correctly, Axis control of Transcaucasus flips Turkey into the Axis camp. So that's good to preserve and protect at all costs. Even if there doesn't seem to be any obvious threat, sometimes it's just good to drop some units off there just in case. Now on the Far East side, we see some more Russian troop movement happening here. We see they, there was an aborted border clash. Now we're trying to play the tournament rules without too much mulligans. Because the issue is, is like, once you start giving out mulligans and saying, oh, you know, can I go back and do this? then uh, you know it might escalate and the next person says okay well I forgot to do this and, and then they might step it up an extra notch and then you, you have people with the debate of like well your mulligan was only this size and my mulligan is this size and you don't want to allow me to do my thing and it gets a little bit difficult so there so we're playing quite strict and if if you don't uh, if you forget to do an attack you shouldn't be able to do the attack something like that or if you announce all your co uh, attacks and then um, if you've announced them then you can't and, and you've rolled for some of them, you can't go back and, and announce another one, right? So there was gonna, there was an aborted border clash here, and like and so likewise, this likely this turn there will be a secondary border clash against any, either one of those territories. Now we had a quick question, which you guys might be able to advise us on. Can you border clash from one territory here, and also one territory here? Basically, use one territory for two border clashes, or is it only one for one, and then you can't use that? territory to border clash anymore. So it's worthwhile asking and some of you might know the answer. In regards to in regards to the CCP territory, so I'm going to explain a little bit what our intentions were. So the way that we're playing this game is because it's a tournament, it's hard to know what to house rule in and house rule out and it's hard to know what people would consider gamey and what not. Then we said it's all holds, uh, no holds barred, everybody do what you think is best. And and we talked about this prior to the game starting on both tables. You know, we had a big talk about it. We, you know, we covered house rules in regards to like the host's rules for the, the staying here. Um, we also talked about what we're going to permit within the course of the game. And so before this game started, I took my, you know, the entire table to the side and says, look, how do we want to do this? Do we want to say no holds barred or do we want to kind of just play rules as written and whatever the rule, sorry, do I want to play rules as written and whatever rules permit we play, or do we want to try to decide what's allowable and what's not? Because I have a pretty bad radar in regards to do, to knowing what's considered gamey or not. And I think it's because I have four brothers and we used to play some board games and it was basically do what you can to win. Whatever the rules say you can do, you do. Unless it's specifically, you know, unless we specifically decide that the rules are somewhat broken and we get more enjoyment out of uh, house ruling things in. So, I said, look, I have a bad radar for this. So how do you want to play it? And we collectively at, at the table confirmed from the Axis, confirmed from the you know, Soviets and confirmed from, from the allies themselves that we're going to say no holds barred across the whole table. So with that in mind, we spent our first turn by the KMT declaring war on all the northern warlords. And shortly afterwards, the CCP declared war on all the southern warlords. And our idea there was so that we can start moving troops to the front lines. Now, initially, after the first term, because Japan it really pushed Japan's hand to try to invade the second term, because they didn't want us to have time to bring all our forces to the front lines and also have the, the benefit of several turns worth of income. And so they came in hard on the second turn, and they did quite amazingly well. They took out uh, these two territories here, and they had only Peking, Shanxi, and some of these back territories belonging to the CCP. And so at that point, I made a little mistake, and I thought, well, they're going to come after me next turn, because why not? Uh, because I saw this big stack sitting here, and I thought, well, they've already got these two territories. They're going to simply push down to this territory, or amphibious assault one of my coastal regions here, take out my fleet. And so I thought, I'm going to be defeated in detail uh, if I keep myself spread across one, two, three, four territories. I thought I need to condense that down to three. And so I pulled everything off of Shantung and fortified my other regions over here. But I, this is a mistake I made because sometimes it's good to take casualties. This is one thing I admire about Kaiser uh, Serenora because he plays boldly. And yes, mathematically, and he calculates things, but he plays sufficiently boldly, whereas I'm always too calculating and almost too defensively minded. So what happened at that, like, I did not take into account that Japan might do other things aside from going after me. It's kind of like that focus uh, on just your 
turf and protecting your turf. So I looked at that situation and I thought, hey, he's going to come after me. But then I didn't think that maybe he's going to try to take out Peking. Maybe he's going to try to take out Shenxi. Maybe he might go into my back territory here or something like that. Do something else as opposed to just going solely after me because it would take him a little bit more effort to go after me. And so I should have stand my ground here. And yes, maybe I would have lost the territory. I, I, I think I would have lost the territory, but at least it would have taken off pressure from the CCP, right? And thereby, he could have come in strongly on the second turn and took advantage of a somewhat weakened Japanese forces. So I pulled back from that territory. This is on the second turn I'm speaking of. And, uh, and then on the Japanese turn, since they didn't have any targets on my end of the world, they went instead to Shenxi and Suyan up here. Oh, sorry. They went to Shenxi, Peking, and they also tried to go after... Oh, yeah, because on the CCP turn, they took over this. On the third turn, they took, took this back over. There's only two Japanese units there. And so on the Japanese turn, they went into Suyan, Shenxi, and uh, Peking. And they didn't go after Shantang at all. Even though there was just one militia on there, they were too stretched thin at that point, And their logic was, and I don't fault them on this logic, take out a portion of the CCP because then you have then you have a bit more ability to deal with it. You don't have to worry about them as a threat so much. Now, this one was quite dicey at best. They only had a 50% chance of winning. This one, luck came in on the side of the Kaiser and he actually throttled uh, the Japanese forces and, and decimated them quite sizably. I believe he got five hits on the first round to the Japanese three and they had basically all their aircraft barring one. So looking at that, that's one, two, three, four, five, six aircraft. Maybe it was four aircraft that went in there, or five aircraft, but a sizable portion of their forces came in here, as well as some infantry, some artillery, and uh, and they just did not manage to take that territory. And in fact, they lost everything down to, I believe it was two artillery, and yeah, two artillery, and had to pull back from that because otherwise they'd start losing some valuable units. And just that shock value of what, as well, of not doing very much damage and uh, being uh, uh, you know, being spanked in return, something like that, right? Shenxi was dicey at best, and so they ended up losing that one. I mean, it was 50-50, so it was worth a shot, at least for one round. But in the end, it didn't quite work out. Now, when I looked at that on the Japanese turn, I thought, well, you know, he could probably afford to put another aircraft here because this one was overkill. But in the end, it worked out to be, <laughs> it worked out to be a, a difficult situation all around. Even in Peking, there was two... Um, there was two CCP militia in that territory, and even those, they hit two snake eyes, or they hit, you know, snake eyes, they hit two ones, and took out two of the Japanese forces, and they, you know, in the end, I believe they took out three, maybe it was just two, but two forces on the first, Japanese forces on the first round, and then they survived like six rounds of combat before they're finally wiped out completely, so really quite astounding luck that he had on that turn, and, you know, when it comes to luck, I, I find it a little bit distasteful when people say, oh, you only won that game because of luck, because skill comes into that as well. And so I don't want to sell the Kaiser short. He did have some luck, but sometimes you make your own luck. And uh, I know that's a saying that goes around. I'm not profound by saying that, but he did quite well. And, and I applaud him on that. And I want to applaud my opponents just as much. You know, Japan made the right call in invading China when it did. It had two choices. It could have either given up on China in its entirety and say gone after the Dutch East Indies to make its money, you know, on turn two or three and completely give up on China. But the issue there is China might just simply go capture Japanese territory over there. You know, they don't know what kind of deal the CCP and the KMT have struck. And we have something called, what do we call it? I, I wish I had it printed off, but we had an agreement I wrote up on Microsoft Word, annotated it had spaces for signatures and such. I never actually brought it here. I should have, but my printer broke down. But they don't know what kind of deals we have struck in this situation. We don't know if I'm going to backstab them immediately or not, or how long our truce will last. Um, something along those lines. So that's what they're faced with. And so in the end, they went into in Chinese territory. And uh, I think that's what they had to do at that point. But right now, with the bad luck the Japanese have had, it just did not quite work out. So I should speak about what the Japanese did. I have to some extent. So last turn, like, like I said, they tried to capture these territory and had to retreat to this territory. And on that territory, we only have three, in, three artillery, one infantry, and a, a host of aircraft sitting right there with those three aircraft parked over there. So it is a very strong force but with a lot of expensive units. So if a person was in position, they might want to grab some of those higher value units. Now, I did not have my KMT set up this way last turn. At the start of the third turn, this stack was not here. It was only a militia sitting there. Now I have a stack of, what is that, seven infantry and an anti-aircraft gun sitting in that position. So we are putting pressure on 
the Japanese and they might be forced to retreat, depending on what they, they feel like is the best move for them. Okay, so the Japanese forces, they don't have too much because they only start with one major factory. So they also had to upgrade. If they want to get anywhere with tech, they had to upgrade. And so they spent, if I remember correctly, they spent one turn trying to upgrade their factory. Six bucks, right? And so that takes a slice out of their income already. And then they built, I believe, two artillery and a marine uh, and a mountain infantry up here as well. So that soaked up all their income. So they don't, they have a, an absence of units here, but it was almost a necessary thing that the Japanese needed to do to upgrade that factory. Otherwise, they're going to have a horrible time against the Americans with only one tech dice to their name each and every turn. Now they have two tech dice, if memory serves, or yeah, they have two tech dice because they upgraded a factory. And, uh, and so things are a little bit easier on them. So it was a necessary thing, and so that's why we see less units present at this current time. But it means that they're not going to be quite strong enough to really make any huge movements in China. Yes, any single territory they decide to take, they can probably pick up. You know, any of my KMT territory, if they go towards them, it'll be expensive, but they can do it. But um, CCP territory is still up there, uh, available for them to grab. But will they do it, or will they pull back? recover a little bit, build some more infantry type units to absorb those hits because right now, collectively across, across their entire front, the cheapest unit they have is they have two infantry, one here, uh, one in Peking and one over here. That's the cheapest unit. Everything else, mountain costs for two artillery, you know, uh, artillery here costs for these three artillery costs for, it's going to be expensive for them. So they might have to hold off and build some more expensive units is maybe what their plan is, right? It's hard to know exactly. I'm just guessing and trying to read into their minds a little bit of what their intentions are. So that's roughly what I see on the Japanese side of things. They might decide we're giving up on, on Asia altogether, but then they surrender all these territories here. One, two, three, four bucks worth of income that they might have to surrender in that case. So they're stuck in a difficult position. And there's really nothing else that they could have done. Like, I think the Japanese could have been a little bit more cautious on their previous turn. And, and instead of trying to grab three territories, just grab two, perhaps, right? Um, and that would have left them in a much stronger position. But it's one of those dangerous things that mountains are horrific. <laughs> when you're attacking into two mountain territories with your aircraft, it's really a tough spot to be in. So, And, and also, the, we have to, don't forget, too, that... We've had some nice lend lease from the Allies in the form of two anti-aircraft guns from the British, and the Russians also sent an anti-aircraft gun to the CCP, which negates a large portion of the Japanese combat ability. Okay, we've talked about Japan now. Let's move on to the British. The British are stuck in the same position the French are in the fact that we don't know what the what the Germans are going to do, which is one of the nice strategies that general uh, global war enthusiast incorporate into his game. We don't know if the Germans are going to be building a massive submarine force or massive tank force or an amphibious force or a massive air force. We don't really know. So we're stuck in this position of not knowing exactly what to do. So we've moved some fleets around in anticipation of, of some things or other, because if the Germans don't want us to engage the Kriegsmarine, they just move into the Baltic. So there's only so much we can do with our naval forces. Other than that, it's just a, a, a game of, of reinforcing certain territories and protecting it and hoping to anticipate some of the attacks that come around and putting ourselves in a position where we can take advantage of certain situations, but it's a tough call to be in, right? So they have also not sat idle either. They've been pretty good or they've been fantastic allies in the sense of lend leasing to the people in need, to KMT, as well as to the Republican Spain. So they have taken up the brunt of any lend leasing duties right now. Now the hope is later on that the USA, once they're allowed, will start lend leasing in a strong way back to all those people that they need to lend lease to, and Britain specifically. They're going to see some fairly massive lend leasing going on with a large portion of the British income, uh, sorry, American income just disappearing towards lend lease. So that's what's occurring there. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into detail with the British Commonwealth because realistically there's not too much to talk about because they're just basically reinforcing, garrisoning, and honestly, when it comes to defensive tactics of my allies, I don't really want to cover it just in case because I, I for one, don't know exactly what it's going to look like. I have some inclinations of what the plans are, but until we know what the Germans do and what Japanese intentions are, then it's basically just a game of, of reinforcing and preparing and hoping to have some launching off points to do some damage in places that need it, something like that. So that's the scoop behind that. Um, the French are exactly in the same position. They've gathered their forces here in France, anything that was not nailed down, they gathered in France. And even what we did is upgrade the militia in Syria to bring into France as well, with the hope that we can put a little bit of a sturdy defense 
against the against the Germans. And another way of looking at it too is if this became Vichy with that uh, Vichy militia, well then you have another whole problem there as well. Is now you have to deal with to capture that territory back. Now you have to engage that militia. So instead we upgraded it, sent it to France. At least they'll do some duty over there. Something along those lines. Its fleet has gathered in the Mediterranean as a potential counter to the Italians. Uh, its submarine forces have come over here to the Pacific. Now, this is something I, I do because my reasoning is where would you rather have where would you rather have a Axis submarine? Would you rather have them in the Atlantic where it can engage all the British convoy lines or in the Pacific where most of the convoy lines that are exposed in the early game belong to the Japanese. So that's roughly the idea of, of why that is there. So if these um, French subs over here, there's three of them, four is upcoming. If two of them become Axis and two of them free French, well, we'll see what we need to do at that point, but we're in a position that we can take advantage. It's not going to be a major threat to us, but the advantage of it for us is that we can simply push them back or we can simply sail the submarines back to the Atlantic if need be or pose a threat to the Japanese Exposed convoy lines here, and let's not forget that they are somewhat valuable, these convoy lines. Let's see. They're worth five and five, so ten IPP on this side of the globe. So that's something worth taking a look at as well. So that covers the French, and lastly, the Americans. Now, Americans, of course, they've got nothing going on. We can't even move our units on the Pacific Theater, so we've just been sitting by. We upgraded two factories, so now we get seven tech dice each and every turn, which is nice because America has, well, it has some, it needs to get four victory or four techs completed for its victory point. And some of them are difficult to get. Some of them you need to get a dice roll of nine or better to succeed. So that's, what is that, 25% chance only of success. So some of those you want to start fairly early on. So that's what's going on across the board. I will lastly touch on the KMT, although there's not too much to be said. I've covered my problem with Shantung there and the mistake I made there. Although it's not a large mistake, it's just one of those things that I want to be humble and not not uh, not you know toot my own horn too much and say, hey, look, you know that was an issue. I'm, I'm not as sufficiently bold as I should be. But the KMT right now is just essentially reinforcing our front and trying to put pressure on the Japanese forces and really push back because our, our rationale here is. If Japan is tied up in China, then that benefits the allies at large, you know, because we have boots on the ground and, and the ability to fight. So that's a rough idea there. The lend lease now at this point is probably going to dry up from Britain because Britain's got other concerns and we'll have to wait until the tides turn a little bit or the Americans can start shipping lend lease to wherever they need to go. So that's the whole scope of yesterday's three turns. So I feel in many ways that in some ways a lot happened in these last three turns. I know it, maybe it's just because of the KMT situation, but uh, at least a lot to think about. Uh, I've had a lot of fun and I've really enjoyed myself. And, you know, honestly, a good chunk of the pleasure, like it's a fantastic board game, fantastically designed, but you know what adds the modifier to my enjoyment is just the board itself. Like I, I really just enjoy looking at the board. There's always these little things to enjoy on it. Like we've seen, we've seen these Zeppelins over here flying around in, in uh, they don't do anything, they're just artistic, but the Hindenburg over here and the Graf Zeppelin up there, just fun to look at. Everything on this board is nice to look at. There's always something to, to take note of, different flags and roundels present across the map. And then these icebergs as well. I don't know if you've noticed, but I think it's just the coolest little thing. And, and I don't know, it, it just adds extra flavor into the map. So. I was saying like, ah, next time we come back here, because each time we come here, the game has improved and gotten much more fancier. I was saying next time we're going to have like this hol holographic projection across the table with misters creating this rainstorms and such going across the globe. <laughs> yeah, uh, Sky Marshall just walked through and he nodded. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to have a fantastic thing. It, it, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing, all this stuff. So... Anyways, that's my roundup of what this turn will look like. What will happen in the future turns really depends on the axis because allies are in the position of reacting to issues that come up. So at this time, I think just because of this Japanese situation, I'm pretty optimistic on the Asian side of the theater, but the, the Atlantic side leaves me in a nervous wreck occasionally because we really don't know what's going to happen there. So it's too early to say, but I'm really enjoying things too uh, so far, and it's, uh, it's hard to say who will win the game. But I think... You know, just because of the nature of the CCP and the success they've had, it leaves an impression in our minds that, or in my mind at least, that the CCP are going to, or sorry, the, the common turn are going to do quite fantastically well in this game and, and uh, they even take away first prize at this table. That's just the impression that sticks in my mind, but I could very well be wrong. But uh, it's too early to say, and we have a formidable stack of uh, money there happening in Germany, 
And, <laughs> you know, once that comes into play, it's a whole other ball game and things will radically turn different once, once the map starts turning into that German round old color. That's about it. So I hope you all enjoyed this video and uh, please comment any questions you have. I'm also posting some images up on Facebook, on the Axis and Allies Facebook page. If people are interested in following along a little bit there, there's also Sky Marshall's got a lot of videos that he's putting out. And I really appreciate these guys for doing every turn uh, video roundups and such, and that's fantastic. And then also General Hanbanese covering his table as well. So please check that out for extra content that a person wants to have. All right, guys. Thanks. Cheers.